My name's Mark Kessel and I'm uh, an artist and an ex-doctor. Um, I've been in New York for about 16 years and during that time I've made artwork that is mostly about the nature of being human in some form. Uh, the practice of medicine looks good from the outside, but to be honest, it's not that much fun when you're doing it. After all, you're surrounded by sick people all the time. And people are not at their best when they're sick. And when you're around them all the time, it's not a very cheerful environment to work in, not surprisingly. And so after some years of doing this, I looked for another means of uh, finding more satisfaction in my life. And I took up photography and came to New York to go to art school. Once I was in art school, I discovered a medium that suited all my artistic needs, which was the daguerreotype, because it was as unique as we are as individuals, and it forced people to see themselves in the daguerreotype plate. There was no way they could look at my artwork without seeing themselves in it. And I fell in love with the idea that all perception necessarily is overlaid with your own um, subjectivity, your own way of seeing things, and there's no way of escaping that. Did I dabble in other disciplines? Yes, I did a little bit. Uh, it took some time before I found photography, and among the other things that I considered, strangely enough, were geology, which I did for a few semesters, and uh, linguistics. But in the end, I, I fell in love with photography, and once, once the magic of photography had worked on me, there was no going back. My original medium uh, was the daguerreotype, which was the very first form of photography. It was introduced to the world in early 1839 by a guy whose name it now bears, Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre, and the name daguerreotype comes from his name, although he wasn't really the inventor of it, but that's by the by. It's a very complex process where a silver plate is sensitized to light after being highly polished. It's sensitized using a combination of iodine and bromine, and then it's put in the camera and exposed to light with a subject in front of the camera, and then it's developed in hot mercury fumes and fixed with a fairly normal photographic fixative. Um, the process is highly toxic and very unstable uh, if you expose it to air, but once you seal it behind glass, it's among the most long-lasting forms of photography there is. The nice thing about a daguerreotype compared to any other form of photography is that the plate itself is a mirror, and so you have to see yourself in the image. Initially, when I went to art school, I tried to ignore the fact that I had a medical history, that I had that I'd been a doctor. I tried to make my art as disconnected from my previous life as I could, but it didn't take very long before I realized that you can't escape your past. And so eventually I thought, what the hell, why not embrace it? Why not incorporate it into my work? And I started looking for ways to express the rather specialized knowledge that doctors have that most artists don't. Why deny it? I, I'm lucky enough to have had a type of education and a way and be, have been taught to look at the world in a way that most artists aren't. Um, scientists often are, but then they're not taught to look at the world from an artistic perspective. So once I embraced the idea that um, I should incorporate my medical perspective into my art, I started looking at doing portraits that had a medical bias. And it wasn't a very far step from doing portraits that had a sort of medical flavor to them, to starting to look at anatomy and the nature of the species and the nature of our, our structure and, and our individuality from a biological viewpoint. When I make images of, of human subjects in my art, I'm not really interested in them as individuals, at least not for the Perfect Specimen series. The Perfect Specimen series is looking at us as a species, and so an individual's culture or age or personal characteristics are irrelevant. I'm just looking at them as human as opposed to some other species. And so I'm not looking to identify them in time or place. I don't care what their politics are. I don't care what their skin color is. I don't, I don't care uh, 
about any of the things that influence our relationship to the people around us. I can, I can, I care about the things that influence our relationship to other creatures and the environment around us, not so much to other individuals of our own species. The individuals in the images of perfect specimens are ciphers. They're generic examples of, of an idealized human form, an idealized human life. They're not a specific human. They're every human. They're any human. And that's what's important in that series. In the 19th century, biologists were and biologists and zoologists and scientists generally were obsessed with the idea of the type specimen, the perfect specimen which defined the species. Every species that science, that science knows has a so-called type specimen in some museum somewhere in the world. It's the specimen from which all other examples of that species is are compared and defined. This specimen is considered the perfect specimen of that species. And the concept is completely wrong because there is no such thing as a perfect specimen. N none of us are any more or less perfect than anyone else. No, you know, you put two cats or two flies or two praying mantises side by side. Who's to say which is more perfect? Um, People have tried for millennia to characterize the perfect human being. The most famous and the most iniquitous example, of course, was uh, Adolf Hitler with his Orion Ubermenschen, you know, the, the so-called perfect Orion human beings. It, science considers it a joke. It's, it's laughable. There's no such thing. Who was who to say that a European is any more perfect than an Asian or an African or an Eskimo or anyone else? We're all human, and from a biological viewpoint, that's all that matters. The subject matter in perfect specimens is mostly from scientific museums around the world. I've done a lot of traveling to museums, some of which are not open to the public. Um, there are a few museums which will only allow medical professionals in, and I'm lucky enough to be able to get access to those museums. Many of the specimens that I did photograph are not on public display. They're in the storage facilities of many institutions. Um, most institutions are actually very generous to artists. And if you approach them and let them know that you're serious and your purpose is serious, they will provide access often to the most remarkable material. And once I saw some of the things that museums have in their storage facilities, it began to put ideas in my head and the body of work evolved partly as a result of what I was seeing. So I didn't start out with preconceived ideas in my head. I, I rummaged through many institutions and little by little selected pieces that formed a coherent whole and between them made a story about the human species and that story is the story of our life cycle. When I began making perfect specimens I tried to find things that all human beings had in common and I began to think about what is it that every human life has in common with every other human life? Well, we have our physical form and our genetics. But the only two things that you can guarantee that we share with every other human being is that we're all given life by a human mother for the moment, and we all eventually are on a first name basis with death. Sooner or later, we all die. And those are the only two moments that every human life can be absolutely certain to share with every other human life. And so it seemed natural to focus at least some of the series on those two moments. In fact, the whole series includes other parts of human lives, like reproduction and the development of emotions. But those things differ from individual to individual. What doesn't differ is the moment of birth and the moment of death. My titles play a very important role in the pictures. I'm not trying to tell my audience what to think. I don't want to tell my audience what to think. I want them to think for themselves. But many of the images are a little bit unfamiliar to most people, and so I'm happy to point them at least in the direction that I'd like them to go. The titles are 
intended to be evocative. I'm not telling them what to think, I'm giving them a hint what direction they might consider thinking in. So the titles are deliberately vague. They are what one art critic called miasmic. They have an aura about them that is often mysterious, a little creepy, slightly mystical. They often come from expressions that I've heard or read over the years and that have stuck in my mind as, as an expression of some strange aspect of the human mind that that I can't actually put a physical structure to, but I feel encapsulates some aspect of humanity very well. I've always been a curious individual. I don't know that I would call it a morbid curiosity, but I'm certainly passionately curious. And I'm curious about things, whether they're pretty or not. Many people are more curious about a pretty animal than a not so pretty animal. I'm equally curious about any animal. Now, not all humans are equally pretty, but all humans are equally human. And I'm curious about every one of them. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a shared genetic heritage. Everyone has a shared future. We're all going to the same place, one way or another. My view of the images in Perfect Specimens is not perhaps as dark as many people might, might perceive them. First of all, my medical background makes these images a little more familiar to me than they are to many people. So, so they're not quite as shocking or surprising to me as they are to most people, because I've seen most of this before, at least in a different context. When I began making the images for perfect specimens, I thought about how a creature from another planet, an anthropologist coming from some place that had never seen a human being before, might consider us if they suddenly were confronted with our species. They have no preconceptions, they don't know anything about what it means to be human, and suddenly they find themselves faced with human beings as we know them here on Earth. What would they think of our species? How would they react? What would be important to them about what our species does, how it looks, how it behaves, how its life cycle evolves? It certainly wouldn't be important what today's politics are or what today's fashions are because 500 years ago we would be the same species but everything would have been different and in 500 years from now everything will be different but we will still be the same species and from the viewpoint of an outsider someone who is only interested in us as as a creature those things that occupy our daily lives politics looks celebrity the things that the contemporary world values, in fact. They're meaningless. It may be vain and it may be a little optimistic to believe that the future might be interested in this work, but one thing is for sure, the human species will still be the human species long after I'm gone. And I wanted to make work that the future might consider had something to say to it. If you look at the work that was done by, for example, many 18th or 19th century artists that related to the culture and the customs of their times, they don't really speak to us today because the times have moved on. When we look at a portrait from, say, Rembrandt, we're not really interested in the clothes, we're interested in the character of the human being that we see. Our character as humans hasn't changed at all, no matter what we wear on the outside. And I try to make, in the Perfect Specimen series, a group of images which in a hundred years, or two hundred years, or five hundred years, will st still represent something which people living in that time will recognize as us. They will say, I recognize that. That looks like me. We're living in a very unique time for the human species. This is the first time in our history when the human animal is beginning to change itself, not just on the outside, not just with superficial things affecting the outside of the body, but things which can change the entire species. For example, scientists are beginning to find ways to connect computer chips to certain aspects of the brain. For example, to help blind people to see, or to help people move a limb that's been damaged in an injury. It's only a matter of time till that technology is extended and eventually it's quite possible, it may not be desirable, but it's certainly possible, 
that science will find ways to connect computer chips and all sorts of appliances to the human body so that they begin to join together in some way. This is not a change I'm looking forward to. It's, to be honest, not even a change I approve of, but I think it's inevitable because that's the direction technology is going. And you simply cannot turn back the tide of technology. We're coming to a time in human history where even the concept of motherhood may change. Up until now, no human has ever been born that didn't come from a human mother. But like Brave New World, there may come a time when it's less risky and more predictable for humans to be born in a so-called test tube and developed not in the uterus in a living human being, but in a laboratory or in a factory perhaps, where, where the technology becomes so perfected that a human uterus and a human hormonal milieu is no longer required. It can all be provided artificially with much more safety and much more certainty. I fear that time is probably coming. Maybe it's 50 years away, maybe 100 years away. But there will come a time where even motherhood is a relic of the species. I think my favorite piece in the Perfect Specimen series is an image called Continuing to Act. It's an image that was actually taken in an anatomy laboratory where people were dissecting the human hand. And it's an image of a bucket of arms. They're in formaldehyde, they've been flayed, they have no skin. But they display the structure of the human arm in a way that shows the complexity and the perfection of that mechanism. I remember when I dissected a human hand for the first time, I remember thinking if there was ever anything that approached perfection, the design of the human hand was it. If, if you ever needed to make an argument or if you ever wished to make an argument for external design, for design that was so perfect that it was beyond human comprehension, the human hand would be a pretty good way to, to provide an example. It is, it is impossibly perfect when you see how it works and you see the, the way the tendons slide over each other and everything works perfectly and it, and it fulfills its function in a way that no engineer could even dream about managing. If I could disinter an artist from the past, it might not necessarily be a visual artist, it might be a scientist, someone as well known as Isaac Newton, who saw the world in a different way for the first time, and who explained the world in a way that most people had never thought of before. But in considering visual artists, there are the well-known names who explored the human body, like, for example, Leonardo, but there were many others who were quite transgressive and quite unusual in the way they saw the human body in the context of their time. Many artists who saw the world in a way that their contemporaries did not found ways to express things about the human body that no one had ever seen before or that people didn't want to look at before because they were either considered transgressive or no one had ever thought of them. There are people like Juan Valverde de Amusco who made the famous flayed man image in the mid 16th century at a time when it was it I mean people were being burnt at the stake for examining the human body for doing dissections and he was making paintings of a man holding his own skin in fact holding a dagger as if he just flayed himself now I don't personally want to make images quite so dramatic, but I would like to find a way of looking at the human species with that degree of originality, with that degree of clear-eyed uh, perception that, that has no sympathy for the human being, but, but also is not intended to be cruel. It's intended to portray us as we really are.